Uh, it is a, a honor and a joy, and at the same time, a, a daunting experience to be there. Right? The honor is obvious. The joy is personal. I'll explain a bit about that in a moment. The daunting part is, you know, I have to in some way impart something that is useful to you around this topic of educating for sustainable happiness. Never had to do that before. I'm intrigued by the challenge, and we'll see if I'm able to rise to the occasion. The joy part. Two years ago, my wife, P.J. Blankenhorn, who's here in the audience, and I had an incredible experience of traveling to Bhutan for more than two weeks. It was really a remarkable experience in so many ways uh, to be able to steep ourselves in the traditions in the, in the religion, of course, of Buddhism, in the, in the country. We did a four-day trek, um, went up to about 11,000, 12,000 feet, came down into the, the countryside, visited a rural elementary school, visited a high school in Tempu. There was so much that, that struck us, but I, I do want to take three minutes to do a bit of a bird walk about one thing in particular. We were deeply moved by all of the ways in which the Bhutanese attempt to celebrate and preserve the very best of their traditions. And we see one, one strategy right here in the uh, preservation of the traditional dress, the kira and the go, uh, which some of our Bhutanese friends are wearing this morning. Can you hear me all right? Are we still all right? OK. And so you know it, it's both substantive and symbolic, isn't it, that they keep their traditional dress. Substantively, it is, continues to be an expression of culture. It's also a way of equalization. Everybody wearing the same dress. Nobody glorifying themselves with the peacock dress. Uh, symbolically, it's simply a statement. We honor the past. We honor our traditions. So I just got to thinking last night. Are there any other precedents for this kind of use of symbolism to celebrate our traditions and our past. And might we think about some symbolism while we're here in the next few days for our aspirations? A couple of examples came to mind. I had incredible experience in the late 1960s. I went to a conference on pacifism at Haverford College. A small group of us met with an Indian gentleman, Narayan Desai, a very close colleague and, and uh, disciple of Indira Gandhi's, I'm sorry, uh, Mohandas Gandhi's. He was in his room, sitting on the floor, dressed in khadi. You know what khadi is, anybody? It's a very simple, white, homespun khadi. And he was sitting in front of a uh, portable, collapsible spinning wheel, spinning his cotton, khadi. Now, some of you who may know your history will recall that khadi was the traditional Indian garb, but it became the, the dress of all Indians involved in the independence movement. It was a way of saying to the British, substantively, we are not going to import any more of your cotton. We're going to make our own. And we are going to show our support for the Indian independence movement by spinning cotton and by wearing cotton. It also, interestingly, we learned from now into Sai, it's a spiritual uh, discipline as well. Spinning khadi is incredibly difficult. It requires enormous patience. And so we were talking with Narayan Desai. And at one point, I think I may have asked him, can you, can you tell us, what is the definition of revolution? Yeah, I was 19, full of myself. Oh, I know. I'll never forget his answer, because it's been a beacon for me in all of my work. It's the reason I became a teacher. But uh, I didn't let Jim tell you is that, in fact, I'm a recovering <coughs> high school English teacher. <laughs> the sign said, revolution is the dynamic process of transforming individual virtues into social values. The dynamic process of transforming individual virtues into social values. I see that as a very sincere effort among the people. And I applaud that. So again, what other symbols might we sort of come to mind? And you know, I thought about my favorite kind of shirt to wear as a very interesting symbol. 
How do you know what, what's the category of shirt this is? Anybody know? Hawaiian. Hawaiian, but what else? It's known as an aloha shirt. That's exactly right. I've been wearing them for years, ever since I did some work in Hawaii. My favorite form of shirt. How many of you know the definition of aloha? Anybody? I'm not going to give you time to Google it. You can find it very quickly. Aloha is commonly used as a greeting and as a farewell, but it has a much deeper and richer meaning. It literally is the Hawaiian word for the presence of the divine breath. Aloha means an expression of love, of joy, of compassion, and of oneness with nature. Hence the color. All of, all of the Aloha shirts are in some ways vibrant expressions of nature, an attempt to remind us of the Aloha spirit. Now interestingly, Hawaii recently has turned up in a survey as the happiest state in our country to live in. And I have to wonder to what extent there is still that thread of the aloha spirit that accounts for some of that happiness. And is our sort of last vestiges of an effort to hang on to that. Because you know, people go to Hawaii today, they don't go to seek the aloha spirit. <laughs> they go to buy the aloha shirt <laughs> without even knowing what the word means. So I'm just puzzling on this as a new question for me. How do we represent symbolically? substantively, these aspirations. I don't have an answer for you, but I think it's an interesting question. Because you know, we in America started out with a constitution that didn't talk about gross national happiness, but we did put into writing that every human in the United States has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right? It's in our constitution. What's going on? How has the pursuit of happiness become the purchase of happiness? Well, I'm going to leave that question for a moment and return to it near the end. But I want to first reflect on and build on the wonderful foundation Jim Fry gave us in terms of the transformations in our world and what they mean for us today. Because I completely agree with absolutely everything you said, Jim. Fundamentally, the world no longer cares what you memorize in school. It's irrelevant. Knowledge is growing exponentially, changing constantly, and on every single internet-connected device. A couple of quick examples. How many of you had to memorize the periodic table in high school? All the elements, right? Well, then you can certainly tell me how many elements there are, can't you? I'm sorry, wait, I didn't hear that. A little, maybe over here, a little louder? Well, whatever number you come up with is wrong, because two more were added last month. Oh, and let's talk about planets. How many planets are there again? I don't know. Are we up one or down one? Down one. Poor Pluto. Really? They should not treat a planet like that. It's out of the club. It's not fair. Oh, and let's have a contest. See which one of you can recite the 50 state capitals from memory while I Google them. Let's see who's quicker. But let's use a more serious example. I'll, I'll, I'll think about my friends in Bhutan for a moment. Because, you know, like students everywhere, students in Bhutan memorize the, their times tables. They memorize lots of things in school. Or test it as they get older on things they've memorized. But then I think of that subsistence farmer in Bhutan, which represents 70% of the economy. And like subsistence farmers in Africa and, and, and many other third world countries, what that farmer now has to do is nothing to do with memorizing the times table. He's got to use his cell phone to do his banking. He's got to use his cell phone to determine how much fertilizer to put on his crops and when. He may have studied, or she may have studied photosynthesis, but does he or she understand the chemistry of how to grow a better crop this year? And most importantly, he or she has got to use his or her cell phone to look at the, and study the markets for the commodities. When is the best time to pick your crops to take them to market? What I've come to understand, because my wife's so for this, in 2005, she made me read The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman. How many of you have read that? Raise your hands. Most important book I've read in at least a decade. 
and I give full credit to my wife for my learning. She's my teacher. But what Friedman and others have helped me to understand is that increasingly, around the world, all work is thought work. That subsistence farmer in Bhutan, he must do thought work to succeed. And if he's learned the new skills of how to use that new technology, how to use math, how to use science, <coughs> then he or she is going to be in a dramatically better position than someone who's merely memorized some things in school but doesn't know how to apply them. What's become very, very clear to me is that the world simply no longer cares how much our students know. It's irrelevant. Yes, they need some foundational knowledge, but what the world cares far, far more about is what they can do with what they know, which is a completely different education. The problem then becomes developing students' skill and will. So I want to talk about skill, and I want to talk about will. Again, building on Jim's excellent foundation. Skill. After I read Friedman's book, frankly, I got deeply concerned. I began to worry about what are the skills our young people, not just in this country, but around the world will need for this rapidly changing world. And are we teaching them? What matters most? So I interviewed a very wide variety of executives in the business world, literally from Apple to Unilever to the US military. Excuse me. I interviewed college teachers. I interviewed community leaders. I interviewed recent graduates, asking all of them, what are the skills that matter most today? And what are the gaps? One of the skills we're learning is how to turn off our cell phones. <laughs> no, they didn't tell me that. <laughs> And I came to understand that there's a, there was a stunning agreement around a set of core competencies every young person must be well on the way to mastering before he or she completes secondary school. Not just to get and keep a good job, not just for thought work in the workplace, but equally important for being a lifelong learner and for being an active and informed citizenship, citizen in the 21st century. Very briefly, they are what I call the seven survival skills. And as Jim mentioned, uh, these I described more at length in my last book, The Global Achievement Gap. Number one, critical thinking and problem solving. You know, for us in education, critical thinking is a buzzword. Some of us, you ask us as, as educators, well, what do you mean by critical thinking? We're often inclined to say, well, Hmm, critical thinking. Well, that's kind of like thinking critically. It's kind of a circular thing. We can't define it because we haven't really been accountable for teaching critical thinking. It's not in our tests. But out there in the world of work that I just explored, the world of leaders, they're very, very clear. Critical thinking, first and foremost, begins with the ability to ask really good questions, to ask the right question. They don't care about the memorized answers. Their most important competency is problem identification, which begins with asking the right questions. Critical thinking problem solving, number one. Number two, collaboration across networks and leading by influence. Increasingly, all work is being done collaboratively, except in our schools, practically. And more and more, we rely on peer leadership, not supervisory directions, to figure out how those teams work. Number three, as Jim said, agility and adaptability. The pace of change, the complexity of problems, demands that we be agile and adaptable. Number four, initiative and entrepreneurialism. Interestingly, it was Mark Chandler, vice president and general counsel of Cisco Systems, one of the larger multinational companies, who talked to me about how executives of big companies like his lay awake at night worrying about how to keep that entrepreneurial spirit and that initiative alive in their large businesses, large organizations. He said something very interesting to me. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, 100% in other words, that's simply no longer good enough. He said, it on the other hand, if I have an employee who sets 10 stretch goals, but perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero. But wait a minute, what would that person be as a student in all of our schools? 
Everybody yeah. missed two or three out of ten, right? C, B student? Yeah. We'll come back to this issue of stretch goal failure in a moment. Fifth skill, effective oral and written communication. And it's the number one complaint of both college teachers and employers. I've heard a lot of thoughts and concerns about this in boot talks there as well. Senior executive at Dell, computer company, put it in a very interesting perspective. He said, you know, the reason these kids can't communicate effectively is because they do not know how to think. They don't know how to reason. They don't know how to construct a coherent argument. They don't know how to use evidence. And then he said something very interesting. It warmed my high school English teacher's heart. He said, that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem, and I quote him, he said, they do not know how to write with voice, meaning put their own passion and perspective into their communications so as to be persuasive. Think back to your schools. How many of you had opportunities to write with voice in your high school classes. How many times do our students today have Six survival skill, accessing and analyzing information. I've already explained the importance of that. We're in a world where knowledge has been commoditized and it's free and it's a glut, how do we sort it all out? Last survival skill, curiosity and imagination. Now, how many of you have read uh, Dan Pink's book, A Whole New Mind, raise your hands. So you know he makes the argument that the right brain skills, curiosity, empathy, creativity, are at least as important as the traditional analytic skills that have, we have valued so much in the past. But he gives the reason being that in a very sophisticated consumer economy, people want sort of more elegant products and services that are more creative, that are more empathetic. But I have come to see the importance of curiosity and imagination in a completely different light in the context of the work I've been doing in the last four years. By the way, I'm only going to talk for about another 10 minutes or so. And then going to give you a chance to talk to each other and generate some really good questions and comments for our discussion. I want this to be interactive. But meanwhile, back at the ranch. So the global achievement gap came out four years ago. And by the way, the global achievement gap, simply defined, is the gap between the new skills all students need for careers, continuous learning, and citizenship, versus what is tested and taught even in our very best public and independent schools. So that's the gap. Increasingly, what I found around the world, and I've been to many, many countries, many schools in many countries, is that around the world, increasingly, we only have one curriculum. It's test prep. Yeah. Sadly, I believe in accountability. I believe in assessment. But sadly, the overwhelming majority of tests that are used in our schools around the world rely far, far too much on multiple choice and factual recall. Multiple choice, factual recall tests that tell us nothing about college, career, or citizenship readiness in the 21st century. Multiple choice tests that will not help that farmer in Bhutan be a better problem. So that um, book came out four years ago. Two things happened immediately, or within a year. Number one, I got requests literally from around the world to come and speak. From Taiwan to Singapore to Thailand to Bahrain to Finland, Spain, England, from West Point to Wall Street. Been there. Talked about that. And everywhere I went, you know, it was sort of like in the audience, and there'd be a lot of leadership audiences, not just educators, educator leader audiences. It'd be sort of like those, what are called bubble heads on the backs of car shells, <laughs> like this, right? <laughs> Everybody nodding in agreement. Saying, yep, yep, exactly. The total confirmation that these are the skills that matter most. There's some variation on them. I don't pretend to have the exact right set of skills. But everybody basically saying, yep, all kids, new skills, period. And yes, we are neither testing nor teaching those skills. And a growing recognition that what gets tested is what gets taught. And if you want something taught in your schools, you have to attach an assessment to it. And we have to. So that was the good news, in a sense. I've got a tremendous kind of validation. But then the other thing happened. 
And I'm talking about the collapse of the global economies, plural, which we are still in the midst of. And for the first time in American history, we have seen college graduates. You know, we've been telling kids the ticket to the good life. Go to college. Everybody go to college. Send everybody to college. Well, we saw for the first time in our history kids coming home from college with an average of $30,000 of debt and no jobs. None. Right now, today, the combination of unemployment and underemployment among our recent college graduates is about 50%. 25% have no job at all. The other 25 or so percent have jobs that do not require a college diploma and don't pay a college wage. What went wrong? What happened? These kids have been told, you know, this is the ticket to the good life. So I tried to understand kind of what were the roots of this economic crisis. Were these skills, the seven survival skills, enough? But were, were, were more needed? One of the first things I came to realize very quickly on is that colleges really don't do a very good job of teaching these skills any more than most of our high schools. So that's problem one. Colleges do not teach the skills matter most either. So we have a K-16 problem in K-12. But then as I really got into the substance of the crisis, you know, they talked about fancy things like credit default swaps and a, you know, hyperinflated real estate apartment and so on. You no, know, those weren't quite the right explanations as I studied them. The problem in America and many other of our developed countries is this. We've created economies based more and more and more on consumer spending. Mm -hmm. You have GNH, we have GDP, gross domestic product. More than 70% of the American economy is based on personal consumer spending. 70% of our GDP, 70%. And for our Canadian folks, I was curious this morning, because I did a little research, yours is 57% and growing. In fact, all developed countries have more and more dependence on consumer spending. And worse, we are preaching to the rest of the world via our very powerful media that you too should want this cornucopia. <laughs> that the good life is not the pursuit of happiness, it's the purchase of happiness. That's what we preach to the entire world through our media. Live like us, but they can't. But it goes even deeper. As I really studied the problem, I came to understand that that consumer-driven economy has been fueled more and more in the last 20 years by people going into debt, pulling money out of their houses as fast as they could, putting money in their credit cards as fast as they could. In 2007, the savings rate in America was minus 2%. It's become increasingly clear, not just to recovering high school English teachers like me, but to economists and many others, that economy is not sustainable. An economy based on people spending money they do not have to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process, is not sustainable. Not sustainable economically? Far too much dependency on consumer spending. Sure, there's always going to be consumer spending, but be that dependent on it? Not sustainable environmentally, for all the reasons we know. Not sustainable spiritually. But what's the alternative? Where do we go from here? How do we reduce our dependence on consumer spending? Well, as I studied the problem, one word emerged over and over again. Innovation. The idea being that we need to create an economy based more on people creating new ideas to solve problems. Ideas that create jobs, that create wealth, that add value to our society. And I don't just mean the, the disruptive, brilliant innovators like a Steve Jobs. I'm talking about the ability to be a creative problem solver. At its heart, that is the definition of innovation. Problem solving without creativity does not lead to innovation. Conversely, creativity without an application to real problems doesn't result in innovation either. So the challenge then is, how do we develop the capacities of many, many more young people to solve problems creatively, to be more innovative in whatever form of work they do, not just the high-tech stuff, not just science, technology, engineering, stuff, but in anything? How do they become creative problem solvers? 
So as I studied this problem and began to ask the question, what, what do we need to do as parents, as teachers, as mentors, and employers? First question that came to my mind is, well, what's the role of education? America has been known as a very innovative society, although, by the way, now ranks 10th in the world, and we're near number one. Uh, but is that because of or in spite of our education system? Or is it the availability of venture capital, infrastructure, immigrant talent, and so on? Quick, trivial pursuit question of the morning. I will a ask and answer it so fast you will not be able to Google the answer. What do Bill Gates, Edwin Land, who invented the Polaroid instant camera, Mark Zuckerberg, a Facebook fan, and Bonnie Raitt, the folk singer, all four have in common? They were not college dropouts. They were Harvard college dropouts. <laughs> Different. You know, Steve Jobs was just a college dropout. Michael Dell was just a college dropout. These guys were Harvard college dropouts. I love them. So you have to wonder, you know, if so many of our most successful innovators dropped out of school, what's the value added of, a, of an education and what should it be? So what I decided to do with this new book, which is just out, called Creating Innovators, is I interviewed a wide variety of young people in their 20s who were highly, highly innovative, some in science, technology, and engineering, some who were artists and musicians, some who were social entrepreneurs, social innovators, creating movements for change. And, and after I interviewed them and tried to really understand who they were, I then studied what I call their ecosystem. I wanted to understand what are the forces and influences that had most shaped them to become <coughs> successful young innovators. I interviewed all of their parents. I then asked each one of them, is there a teacher or a mentor who would make the greatest difference in their lives? Most could name a teacher, some could not. But all could name a mentor, if not a teacher. I then went and interviewed every one of those teachers and mentors. And I came to discover a pattern among all of those teachers that I continue to find profoundly disturbing and challenging. And it is this, that in every single case, every one of those teachers, and I'm talking from elementary school all the way through graduate school, every teacher whom I interviewed was an outlier in his or her educational setting. Teaching in ways that were radically different and his or her peers. Then I went to those few high schools and colleges that have a world reputation for graduating innovators. There are not very many, literally, I count them on one hand. High Tech High in San Diego, the New Tech High Network around the country, uh, the brand new Olin College of Engineering, which I would urge you if you have time on Monday, after you've gone to Harvard, which is about the past, go visit Olin, which is about the future. They're just a few miles apart. Olin College of Engineering, the MIT Media Lab, which you might also visit if you have an opportunity, and the uh, Institute of Design at Stanford. All schools that are graduating innovators. And I looked at those classes, I talked to the teachers and students, and lo and behold, the teaching that goes on in those few places was an exact fit of the teaching that my outlier teachers demonstrate. Total consistency within and across these classrooms. And I've come to understand, and this is the note, that the culture of schooling that we have known for many generations is radically at odds with the culture of learning that produces young innovators in five essential respects. And this may be one of the greatest challenges, in addition to changing what we teach, it's how we teach. Because the culture of learning to become an innovator is about more than skill. It's about will. It's about motivation, as you'll see. Contradiction number one. Culture of schooling is all about celebrating individual achievement and grading and sorting kids along the bell curve. You're more talented than this kid. And that, fine, there's a role for that. But in all of these classrooms for young innovators, there was a recognition that innovation is a team sport. And accountable teamwork was built into every single assignment. And teamwork was valued as much as individual achievement. Reminiscent of a, of a Buddhist teaching about the importance of working together. Number two, contradiction number two. Culture schooling around the world is all about becoming a specialist, right? 
We've divided and conquered the high school universe by separating content, chemistry this, biology that. And you specialize. You go to college, you major. You become an academic. You get tenure. How do you get tenure? You get tenure by knowing this much about something that teeny. <laughs> when I did my, began my dissertation work at Harvard, I was told by my thesis advisor that my dissertation should be a conversation between myself and one or two other people <clears throat> in the world. Four years for a conversation with two people. <laughs> I uh, struggled hard and found a different way to do it. By contrast to that kind of very specialized, compartmentalized world, the world of learning to become an innovator looks at problems and challenges from a multidisciplinary perspective. I interviewed Judy Gilbert, who was then director of talent at Google, and she said if there's one thing educators must realize and change is that problems can neither be understood nor solved within the individual boundaries of specific academic disciplines. Contradiction number three. World of schooling is about penalizing failure and creating risk aversion for both students and teachers. You're discouraged from taking risks. You make a mistake, you're penalized. Oh, that'll be 20 points off. Oh, one day late. Oh, I don't know if I can even read that. <laughs> By contrast, the world of learning to be an innovator is all about making mistakes and taking responsible risks and learning from them. I went to IDEO, the most innovative design company in the world. IDEO as a company has a motto. Right. You know what their motto is? Fail early and fail often. <laughs> Heck of a way to run a company. But do you know what they said? They said there is no innovation without trial and error, without failure. I went down the road to the Institute of Design at Stanford, fascinating interdisciplinary problem-based curriculum, talking to a group of teachers. They were so sitting around the table saying, yeah, you know, we're actually thinking the grade F is really the new grade A. A little cautious taking that back to your <laughs> He's a little more iteration for us. Speaking of iteration, I talked to a student at the Olin College of Design, Olin School of this, sorry, Olin College of Engineering. And he said, you know, actually, we don't even talk about failure here. We talk about iteration. So here's a here's an interesting thought. How do we take that F word out of education? Failure. Failure can be the result of a lack of effort, perhaps. But if you've tried and come up short, is that a failure? If you really tried hardest, as Mark Chandler said, you set 10 stretch goals and perhaps only succeeded seven or eight, why and how can we call that a failure, as opposed to an iteration? And the difference, of course, being the capacity to reflect. And that's one of the most important competencies to teach is the difference between a failure and an iteration is that you reflect on the experience and you learn from that experience and apply what you learn. The fourth contradiction. Culture of schooling is a profoundly passive experience. That's why we'll stop shortly and give you a chance to talk to you. We spend far too much time in our classrooms sitting and getting. Yeah? Right? In fact, that's, I'm beginning more and more to wonder, maybe that's where we learn to be such good little consumers. Because that's how we spend a lot of our childhood, isn't it? But more than that, we've learned to consume school itself as a product, as a, as a commodity, as a consumer good. We've learned to consume classes to get good grades. We've learned to use and consume grades to get into a good school. Everything becomes a process of consumption. By contrast, all of the classes that produce young innovators were all about creating, not consuming. They produced real products for real audiences. They solved real problems. They looked at real challenges. Nothing was prepackaged. Very fundamental distinction. But it's this last contradiction that actually may be the most important for this. Most important. The fifth contradiction is all about motivation, will. 
In our classrooms, in the culture of schooling, historically, we've, li we've relied far, far too much on extrinsic incentives, A's and F's, to reward and punish learning. Money for good grades. Pizza on Fridays if you do well on the test. But what I came to discover is that these young innovators, from backgrounds of both privilege and poverty, were far, far more intrinsically motivated. And that their, both their parents and their teachers had gone to great lengths to very intentionally develop and nurture those intrinsic motivations. You know, we are all of us born with intrinsic motivations. We're all born curious, creative, imaginative. We're born with innate capacities that enable us to be more innovative. In fact, as an infant constructs their understanding of the world, it's frequently very innovative. You ask a four-year-old, kind of, how is the world made? You get fascinating answers. The average four-year-old asks a hundred questions a day. By the time he or she is eight or nine, he's learned to be quiet, sit still, and give the right answer, as opposed to ask a question. So, I then became really interested in what did these parents and teachers do to continue to cultivate the capacities of intrinsic motivation that I see as so important. And this is what I discovered. Both parents and teachers nurtured a developmental spiral of play, passion, and purpose. Play, passion. Parents of young children encouraged more discovery-based, exploratory play. They did not schedule their kids' days up to the hill. They made sure their kids had time to get outside and play. As one parent said to me, you know, sometimes these kids have to actually become bored in order to learn how to be not bored. They limited screen time, whatever screen it was. Fewer toys, toys without batteries, sand, block, paint, clay, water. When kids were older, Legos. Toys you can do many, many things with. Toys you have to use your imagination with. As their kids began to get older, parents really tried to provide their kids with a buffet. Not an overwhelming set of choices, but buffets in order to discover what was it that most interested this child. What were they, what were they really curious about? What were they interested in? What do they want to know more about? Get better at, do, explore. They valued their children finding and discovering a passion more than merely achieving well academically. Because they knew that was going to be the engine of self-discipline, the engine of perseverance, that really mattered most. Teachers did the same. They built time into their classrooms for students to do more independent investigations, independent research and projects, asking their own questions, making the learning alive and their own. As these young people became, grew older, what was so interesting is that both teachers and parents understood they could not pigeonhole their kids by saying, oh, this, he's going to be a scientist. Johnny's a student scientist at the age of 12. He's going to be a scientist. They knew better than that because they knew that passions change. They evolve. They morph. And in every single case, what happened was these passions matured into a deeper sense of purpose with all of the young people simple desire to give back and make a difference in the world, in whatever they were doing. And those values were imbued by both parents and teachers. And that expression of purpose became a more mature kind of passion, as well as a form of adult play. They love their work. It's fun. And there's a lot we could talk about in terms of the implications for this and what does that mean for what you do on Mondays, and I'm happy to address some of that at the Q&A. But I want to finally come back. So what does creating an innovator have to do with sustainable happiness? Two things, quite simply. We need a generation of young people committed to answering the question how we preserve life on the planet for everyone. That is the most pressing problem of humankind. We need every young person to be a creative problem solver if we're going to sustain life on this planet with quality and dignity for every person. But the second point, that's the sustainable part. Here's the happiness part. 
at least my personal concern. Eric Fromm, in 1971, wrote a book called To Have or To Be. And for me, that frames the fundamental choice for all of us. Are we consumers or are we creators? And what I've come to understand is that for those of us who have been fortunate, not because we have more talent than anybody else, it's not to do with talent. When I took up classical guitar, I'm a horrible guitarist. But it was an opportunity for me to create something beautiful every single day, just for me, just for myself. So I think what we've come to understand is that if we educate young people to be innovators, we've done two things. We've given them the skill and the will to acquire the knowledge they need to make a difference in the world. Skill and will. And we've given them a different reason for being in the world. To make a difference and to create. Thank you. My question is very brief, actually. Uh, when, at what point, will Harvard and other leading universities stop requiring SAT scores? It's, you know, it, it's, a, it's an important question, and I have absolutely nothing to do with the answer, but I will tell you that Bill Fitzsimmons, Dean of Admissions at Harvard, chaired a special commission two years ago urging colleges to radically de-emphasize de use of all standardized tests for two reasons. Number one, they have a huge class bias. You can afford a tutor, you'll do better. That's right. And number two, there really turns out to be not a good predictor at all of college success. GPA is a far better predictor. So right now, today, there are 750 colleges and universities, including very selective ones, that no longer require any form of standardized testing. Bates, Bowden, Colby, Carlton, to name just a couple. So you don't have to do well on a test to get into a selective school any longer. And Tufts, interestingly, is experimenting with a whole new idea. Two years ago, Tufts University became the first in the country to invite students to submit YouTube videos for their college, with their college application, found them to be far more informative and, and uh, interesting than any other part of the application. But the larger issue here, I think, is that we have to help parents understand that the selective college route no longer, there are a number of problems with it. Number one, it's not at all clear that it is in any way a competitive advantage to go to Harvard today. One of the young innovators whom I interviewed, brilliant young engineer, started his first nonprofit in Sierra Leone when he was a high school student, Better Ways of Distributing the Malaria Nets, came to Harvard as a work study, worked in a lab, worked with some others to discover a way that dirt-eating microbes could generate electricity. Yeah. I talked to him five days before his Harvard commencement, about to get his BA in engineering. We talked for terrorists. He said, you know, I said, you haven't said a word about any of your courses at Harvard. He said, that's because I don't remember a thing from any of them. <laughs> Except for Spanish. He said, I did learn to speak Spanish. He said, everything I learned that I valued came outside the classroom. What now with the availability of free courses from Princeton, Stanford, MIT, Harvard. Here's the choice. Are you, you going to take free courses? Or are you going to spend $50,000 a, a year, maybe go into debt for more, 100000 100, To what end? For what purpose? Oh, and by the way, getting into Harvard today, one-third increase in the number of applicants to selected schools from the Far East. The opportunities for kids from white middle class or upper middle class American schools to get into Harvard is getting shorter and shorter every year. You want to get your kid into Harvard? Move to Idaho and have her take up the, tuda, the tuba and football. <laughs> Seriously, I think we have to help parents understand that it is not the game changer or the value added that it once was. So in a sense, whether or not Harvard continues to require SATs, in my view, is irrelevant. The damage we do to kids, trying to pressure them into these name brand colleges to no good end, is enormous. Other questions? Sorry to be so long answer that. Very important question. Well, they want to put it on tape. Oh, right. Um, They're videotaping this. 
I, I just basically have a quick question about how you see um, this idea of innovation and critical thinking fitting into something like Bloom's taxonomy, which is still being taught in Teachers College. I graduated in 2009. And so uh, what is the need for the lower order thinking um, in assessment, other than maybe as monitoring, monitoring as a basic form of assessment? Okay. Knowledge matters. As Jim pointed out, you don't teach critical thinking without engaging students in rich and challenging content. You also need content to orient yourself to the world. I don't want students worrying that when the Russians invaded uh, Georgia three years ago, thank you, South Carolina was likely to be next. <laughs> Some kids were. It is. So knowledge matters. But it's, the point is that it's, being, it's become commoditized. You don't need a teacher to get that kind of knowledge. And we're going to have to decide what is foundational knowledge. But more importantly is skill and will, meaning motivation. That if I have the skills to learn and I have the motivation to learn, I can acquire the expertise that I need like that. And so when you think about what is really foundational for a lifetime, it's far more, I think, a matter of skill and will which enables you to acquire new expertises, new basic knowledge, as you need it. I became you know, knowledgeable about economics in the last three years. I never studied economics. And if I had it, I would, it would, have, I would have long forgotten it, and it would have been irrelevant what I learned. So I never had the basics. So I think it's a very interesting question. When and how do you acquire the basics? But from my point of view, with, with the commoditization of knowledge and the constant change and flux of knowledge, these other qualities. They're a three-legged stool, right? Expertise, <coughs> skill, and will. It's a three-legged stool. But how much expertise and when, in relation to skill and will, I think is the real architectural challenge of education in the 21st century. Yes, please. Uh, Thank you. Uh, my question is I just want to follow up on your your uh, example of a student from Harvard who didn't remember anything other than Spanish. And I, I can relate to that. I'm sure many here can too. So the question is, for those of us who are teaching the, the eight to nine year olds who then grow up who have learned not to ask questions, so at the high school, college, graduate level, law level, law school level right now, um, is from your experience and talking to others, is there a way of sort of blowing up the classroom. And Talking about the university classroom now? Yeah, university level, graduate level, even high school level, so that if you have students coming in who are pre-programmed traditionally, and you've got them for one yeah. year or yeah. two years, um, we talked about, or people will be talking about experiential education or ways of, of yeah. forcing encounter uh, outside of sitting at your desk chairs. Right, right now I said so. Well, I think there's, a, there's a multiple answers to that question. I'm sure many people have a lot to share. But I would simply refer you to the work of Eric Deshore at Harvard, who's a teacher of chemistry and other sciences. And he has blown up his classroom by, before he teaches any content, he will give kids, his students, a question or a problem and just say, what's your best estimate? And he engages peers in a process of creating possible answers or hypotheses before he teaches them any content at all. And so he's generating a kind of intrinsic interest in that learning and a framework within which they apply their knowledge. And he did that out of total frustration. He found that over and over again he would teach all these things to these good Harvard kids. They didn't remember a damn thing. They didn't understand any concepts. Zero. None. So he's devolving new ways. Uh, personally, what I would Here's, here's my kind of radical notion, at least in the secondary level. I would like to see the merit badge approach to learning. How many of you are in scouts? Or you so you know. So let's, let's say for a minute that we want all students to at the least earn merit badges in critical and creative thinking, collaboration, communication, and learning how to learn. And that we're going to create a set of performance standards where students have to show mastery in their work of those skills. Now they can show it in a variety of ways. You can think critically in a scientific context, mathematical context, historical context. Maybe you would have acquired it in several. But they would develop 
a body of work. I want every student to have a digital portfolio starting in first grade that follows them through school, that becomes evidence of progressive mastery of core competencies. And then I want them to have to present and defend elements of their portfolio at the end of 12th grade, end of 8th grade, maybe the end of 6th and 10th, or in segments of that sort. And that we have an aligned and coherent set of performance standards, performance expectations. And so students are progressively earning badges of mastery that show they really know how to, to transform knowledge, not just to mm -hmm. memorize it. Yes, please. Do you think that's most appropriately done at the federal level or state by state? Well, in the independent school world, you can do it right now, tomorrow. I mean, there's a, there's a web portal, pathbright.com, P-A-T-H-B-R-I-T-E.com. I don't know that it's the best, but it's free. Kids can start constructing their digital portfolios tomorrow and pull material up from a variety of sources and share it with whomever they want. And the, the, the portfolios live on that website for free. I think in terms of changes in policy, our most urgent task at the national level <coughs> is to create an accountability 2.0 system. And I would say this not just for our country, but for many countries. What we test in most of our countries, at the, particularly at the high school levels, is in no way aligned with any of the things we've been talking about today. So unless and until we create alignment between our testing and our accountability systems, we're not going to be able to change the classroom. What gets tested is what gets taught. We have to have an accountability system where we are assessing the skills that matter most. And there are ways to do that, fortunately. A lot of ways. Yes, please. I'm just so jazzed by what you said about uh, merit badges. Among the things I do, I work with Girl Scout University, and I just want to throw out an uh, invitation. If anybody's interested in pursuing merit badges of mastery, come see me. That's great. Fantastic. Good Thank Scouting you. has really shown us the way. I would argue they know more about the cycle, the, the, the science of, uh, of, of testing than any of our psychometricians currently working, you know, <laughs> Pearson or others today. Yes, please, sir. Uh, we seem to be living in a, a society now that's becoming more fractionated, uh, polarized, uh, ideologically. Um, which is a breakdown of community, uh, yes, uh, yes. certainly national community. How can we use innovation to, uh, which sometimes um, has been part of this process, to make to bring it back together to build a sense of community? I think that's a wonderful question. That's a very interesting question. I wonder how we would build a way to crowdsource problems. And what if we crowdsource that problem to the next generation? What if we, by you all know the term crowdsourcing, it means putting a problem out into the social media and letting lots of people contribute solutions. It's sourcing solutions from the crowd, right? So what if, we, what if we said that? What if we helped young people, first of all, document the problem? Before we go solve it, you know, my favorite quote, the formulation of the problem is often more essential than the solution. We in education have answeritis. It's a serious affliction. <laughs> Teaching solutions to problems we haven't formed. Answers to questions that haven't been explored. But what I'm really intrigued by this notion. What if we found a means to engage several of the next generations of students in a conversation about what has contributed to the decline of community? I would even put it beyond that, because sadly, we have communities. They're all revolving around sharing and reinforcing one another's limited views of the world. We have communities. People who watch Fox News are a community, right? They just don't listen to the people who watch CNBC News. So what if we said instead, how do we rediscover our common purposes, our common values, our village commons? I personally believe it has to come back to sustainability. That ultimately, we build common purpose around saving Mother Earth, and the extent to which we really help young people understand not only how much she is in jeopardy, but how our highly divisive and polarizing and politicizing political processes have contributed to the problem and are interfering with the solution. That might be a step forward. Yes, please, sir. Last question. Oh, dear. <laughs> 
So I went to see the king and I the other day, and his favorite phrase at some point is it's a puzzle. So it seems to me what you're uh, asking is for um, a system that has very few innovators and outliers in it to become innovative and outliers. Yeah. Um, and I struggle with that. Um, uh, sometimes I think I'm innovative and, and an outlier, and the rest of the time when I, I listen to people, I, I feel how traditional I am. Um, and um, it's got to be in some ways emotionally threatening to those of us uh, who are in the, who are bobbleheads, and we say, yes, <laughs> this makes sense, but then we go back to our, our classrooms and... Um, um, and um, the, the bobble's lost, so to speak, yeah, yeah. because we don't know how to do yeah. what it is that perhaps we were never taught to do. I think and, it's a um, profound point. So, now, did you want to any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a profound point. We as teachers teach in the ways that we've been taught. How do we disrupt that? We as parents want schools to look like the ones we went to. How do we disrupt that? I think the first challenge is exactly what Cushing is doing is creating a laboratory school, a laboratory environment, which becomes an existence proof of a very different way of doing things. That's why I'm excited to be here today. I think we need many more lab schools. We need to invest in educational R&D. You know, as superintendents or independent school heads, what's your R&D budget? And they laugh at me. You know, Google, Google has a 20% plus R&D budget, Microsoft, Cisco, and the like. So we need to invest in R&D, which gives people permission to be disruptors, to ask tough questions. That's the first point. And creates a safety net. Jim alluded to that. Giving teachers permission to take, to not fail, not to make mistakes. Let's change our vocabulary. To iterate. Giving permission to iterate. Beyond that, and actually it's how I end the book, Creating Innovators. I think the challenge is to redefine our understanding of the nature of authority. We have thought about authority in the past as the people who have all the answers, the people who are in control. Uh, this is a generation that rejects that kind of authority, as we know. But I think we have to put in place a sense of authority that is about uh, something that is earned, something that is enabling. How about this idea that authority is an enabler? Uh, you, you were talking about last night about these different evolutions. But I deeply believe that the best authorities that I know enable others and are effective coaches for excellence in their performances. Brooks, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. I deeply appreciate what you're doing. Now I'm reminded, as I must be closing a little bit late, I apologize. With uh, the opening lines to Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, you may not perhaps know this. Um, you remember it? Yeah, that's probably the only thing you remember from high school English. Oh, well. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. These are very challenging times in education. I don't mean to remind you, you know this better than I. But I also know that they are the best of times. There are opportunities right now today. And I see people all over the country, people in this room, in the process of rethinking reinventing, reimagining education. I'll share one quick thing with you. My friend Bob Compton said, you know, he, he and I did this uh, video about uh, Finland's education system, Finland, Finland, which I'm not kind of interested in. But he said, you can't just write a book about innovation, it has to be innovative. So he persuaded me in this new book to embed QR codes, scannable codes throughout the book, which when you scan with your smartphone, bring up a series of videos. So we brought in a minute and a half clip of a couple of videos to show you, give you some sense of what's in them, what's in the story. It takes too long to start.
if America doesn't produce high imagination people, we are going to be a very good country. Raising um, someone with an intention that they'll be an innovator is actually different than raising a child that you want to behave all the time and be quite compliant. Some of the people that are the most rambunctious seem to sometimes have the best ideas. I want to feel like what I'm doing every day matters. Of course my guidance counselor told me to go straight to college. My dream manager might not have told me to do that. I came to Tulane because I really wanted to go to a university that was committed to public service. The philosophy of high-tech high is founded largely on the idea of kids making, doing, building, shaping, and inventing stuff. The MIT Media Lab spent far less time in formal classrooms learning theory than far more time on projects building things. Knowledge, in a sense, is a commodity. You can get this on Google. Uh, it's about asking the right questions. It's about having the right insights and perception. Let them fail because they're going to learn more from that than we can ever teach them directly. Our success is measured more or less by the rate of innovation. Thank you again very much, folks.